morning, welcome. We now have 19 people. Hopefully, we'll go up to the 24. Um, Rodolfo is saying he doesn't have entry to my learning. Um, don't worry, Rodolfo, we'll work it out. You don't absolutely need it for this session. But by the end of the session, those of you who don't have access, send me an email and, and um, we will let you know what to do to, to get in. Because you don't absolutely need it for this session. But I've set it up so that you could use it to send in, so I could use it to send information to you. If you want me to look at anything, I'll leave a space for you to upload and so on. So it will be used following the workshop, but not necessarily in this workshop today. But I wanted you all to have it because what I did was, if you all received the email yesterday that I sent out to everybody, um, welcome to those of you joining us. If you received that email, you should have had some files attached. Just quickly put in the chat for me whether you received those files because we'll be using those files today for some of the activities that we're doing. Yes, good morning. I received good your morning. document. Good. I received your document and uh, through this email I get the information. Yeah. Then I seen now I has temporary blockade my my learning. Okay. But I can get in in soon. But okay. uh, I am seeing you perfectly. Uh, listen you, and then no problem. All right, great. Okay, good. So somebody's microphone is on. So could I ask everybody to mute their mics until we need to ask a question? Right. So to start off, and remember what what I'm doing here, Janine. I'll take a question in a minute. What I'm doing here also is modeling the use of Blackboard Collaborate for you all as well so that, you know, in your own classes, you you know, if you haven't used it yet, you could see it used in a context. So I have two questions, um, Marsha and Janine. So Janine first and then Marsha. Janine? Marsha, you can go ahead. I clicked it by accident. Okay. Sorry. All right. Go ahead, Marsha. Okay. You asked us to check. I didn't get the email, so I didn't get the attachment. Oh, I probably didn't send it to you because of your role today. Oh, so, so I don't uh, need it. That's fine. Um, you you may not need it, but I'll send it to you anyway in a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I have with me today. Well, I'm Diane to Robin Kosi. I work at CETL as a faculty development specialist. Some of you know me already. Um, so good morning. I have with me today. Dr. Justin Zephyrin, who also works in the CTL. He is our e-learning support specialist, and he very kindly agreed to come today to join us to help and support him because it's a fairly big group, and I have to do some group work, so that would be very useful. Thanks, Justin. And I have Marsha with me. Marsha registered for the workshop, but Marsha was one of our teaching awardees. She, she actually won the teaching awards. Now, this workshop helps to prepare prepare you to prepare that portfolio that we use for the teaching awards, but it's also really a good activity for you to do as a teacher um, because some institutions actually ask you for a teaching portfolio um, if you plan to go somewhere else to work and it's also a good professional development activity. So so for all of those reasons we, we do it and I'm very happy Marsh is with us today. I did tell her it's you know, it's, it's basically the same workshop we do every year to help people prepare. But I asked her if she wouldn't mind joining us so that she could share some of her experiences with you as we go along. So from time to time, I'll be calling on her to add um, her commentary to some of the things that we're doing so we can have a nice discussion. Okay. Um, so I will start off. Um, the first part of it, I wanted you all to log in just to see that you could get the space. Those of you who can't get in, just send me an email and I will deal with that. So let's start off. I want you all to do this icebreaker, which is related to um, what we're going to be doing. I want you to try to think of a character or it could be a person or it could be an animal or something that for you, represents a motto that guides your teaching. So I've given you my example. The character, the person I've selected, of course, is Nelson Mandela. And so I am Diane Turabin Kusi, and my motto is empower and inspire. And that was kind of motivated, of course, by Nelson Mandela. So 
if you all could just start putting in the chat. Think about it. Give me a minute or two. And you'll understand why I'm asking you to do this. So just, you know, you could put in the chat your faculty, because I can see the names. So you could put your faculty uh, or your department and your motto. And what inspires that motto? If you didn't have a motto, try and think of one now. So I'll give you all two minutes to do that. So Marsha's Challenge Connect Empower. Justin, you can put yours too. Teach the child not the subject. Toto is on the hair story, okay? Inspiring minds. Mm -hmm. Super. Some of you, if you want to use the mic to do it, you can as well. Always learning, always teaching. I'm reading them as you go along. And of course, um, Judy, you'll have to let us know why Sherpa, okay? Because you just put Sherpa. You didn't expand. I hope the rest of you are thinking and, and noting. Nobody wants to grab the mic? Hi, Diane. You put us on the spot, so that's why we're quiet. That's all right. You need to go on the spot sometimes. Shy people, Ryan. Shy people. All right, so I'll leave you all to ponder on it because I know that for some people, as Sharon is saying, you might have been put on the spot, you never thought about it, and you want to think more deeply about it, and that's fine. But the point is, this is something that you have to reflect on and think about, and you'll see why I'm saying that as we move through this process, all right? So you can note it, and you could keep sharing in the chat as we go along, all right? That's fine, too. And so let me just talk you through the workshop objectives quickly. Not going to spend too much time on that because, as I said, we're trying to do this in two hours. So by the end of today's workshop, now this is a two-part workshop. So today and next Thursday as well, another two hours. But for this workshop, what I want you all to be able to do is have clear in your minds what is a teaching portfolio. What is it? You know, because I, long ago a teaching portfolio would be a, a, a folder with a set of pictures and information that you put together and you could hand and show people. But is that still a, a, a portfolio? What is a teaching portfolio? And in keeping in that vein, I want to take you through what are the components that make up this teaching portfolio and to highlight the importance of or the usefulness of having one. Um, it's not just about the, the teaching awards. All right. So and a, a very critical component of the teaching portfolio is your teaching philosophy. And so we're going to spend some time working through what is a teaching philosophy and what should go into it. What it should be. Yes, somebody's yeah, somebody mic is on. Somebody's mic is on. 
we're getting some feedback from that. Thank you. Yes. Um, so you're going to identify the components of the philosophy. And by the end of it, I want you to start writing your teaching philosophy. It's not something that you'll finish in, in, in a couple hours. But at least you should have an idea of what should go into this teaching um, philosophy. So that's where we're going. So the files that I sent you, one of them is a set of definitions of uh, teaching portfolio, what it is. Um, and I want you all to take a few minutes and read the definitions. Now, what we're going to do is put you all into groups. And in those groups, I want you all to come to some consensus about what is a teaching portfolio. And we're not going to give you a lot of time for this. So a couple of minutes to read it on your own. And, and while you could read it while we're putting you all into groups. When you go into the groups, you will not see this screen that's up there. So just take a note of what you're going to be doing in your groups each time we break into groups. So we're going to break into groups and I want you all, when you go into the groups, for you to um, work out what is a teaching portfolio. It's important for you to understand what it is. So take your time and read from those definitions that were sent to you. Masha, I'm going to send you yours in a little bit. And um, in the meantime, Justin and I will put you all into groups. Okay. Any questions before we go? We put you all into the groups? Because when you go into the groups, you will only see the people in your groups. Yes, Sharon? Uh, just a quick reminder of what we're supposed to do in groups. I think my mind fell asleep on you. Apologies. <laughs> OK. When you go into the groups, there is a document that I sent you all called um, definitions of um, teaching portfolios. I sent you all three documents. It's a definition of teaching portfolios. It's the one I want you all to look at now. Read through that. And in your group, yes, come up. You don't necessarily have to choose one, but come up with a definition based on what you might have read. And let's see what you all come up with. This is a group definition and not a personal one, right? I hope you all could arrive at a consensus in the group, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, good. Everybody clear now? Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to put you all in groups. Justin, we have 18 people. So if you have three groups of, of six, I've seen something in the chat. Let me see. Right, everybody's okay. All right, thanks, Justin. Okay, so... Um, Two more to reconnect right um so welcome back and i hope you all had some useful discussions what i what i how i want to do this is i hope that you all selected a spokesperson for each group um i deliberately didn't tell you all any of that i wanted you all to sort of blend and work it out but what I'd want to just capture from each group is if one person would take the mic and tell us what you arrived at as your definition and we move through the three groups like that. Other people could jump in if that's not what you all agreed to. But um, so we'll go group one, group two, group, group three. And then I will share with you a generic kind of um, definition. So we go group one. Who's in group one then? Uh, that would have been the one with Justin. You remember which ones were group one? Well, can I just go as I have the mic and I'm pushing? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> we pulled together the definitions that you shared with us, and we had an interesting discussion about people at different points in their career and where the emphasis should or would be. So just to tell you what we came up with. A teaching portfolio is a comprehensive, cumulative record of teaching activities, responsibilities, philosophy, goals, and accomplishments drawn up by the lecturer to facilitate the presentation of teaching achievements and major strengths 
for self-assessment and interpretation by others. It allows the lecturer to reflect on his or her practice over time. I'm pasting it in the chat. Great, so I was going to it. ask you. Right, great. And the discussion was, one of our team members was um, re commenting that she is near the end of her teaching career in terms of retirement. And for her, the emphasis would be more on her ability to reflect on her practice and achievements and so on over time, as opposed to how others would interpret it. But for somebody who is early or mid-career, the emphasis might be on um, peer assessment as mm -hmm. opposed to self-assessment. Okay. So you all are heavily, you're looking at the, the assessment part either self or by others as a critical part of a teaching portfolio? Well, for some of us, perhaps yes, because um, if you're up for if it's A and Assessment time, and promotion. Mm -hmm. Right. Then your portfolio could be as even more critical in your CV because the CV does not capture all the things that we do. But in the portfolio, you may have a little bit of more flexibility to demonstrate the mm. things that you've done, to reflect on them, have captions, and all those other things that go into helping somebody else interpret. So your perspective the, on, on the importance of the portfolio re depends on where you are in your life cycle, in your work cycle, and that kind of thing. Okay. Any comments on that from other people who would not have been in the group with you? And you could take that and, 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 you know, put yours in at the same time. So someone from one of the other groups to comment. Other Sharon Hutchinson. So we have two Sharon. Hi, 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 Diane. Um, <laughs> Sorry to pick uh, on you. That's okay. But your name uh, is in front of me. Yeah, no problem. Um, I was just thinking, this is a, a good overall um, definition. I was wondering about the self-assessment versus assessment by others a mm -hmm. bit because it's not clear to me at this point how other people will assess your philosophy. I mean, is your philosophy, these things are personal. Um, is it that your philosophy could be wrong, uh, off track? Is you know, I I, I see it as, a, as in a way that says this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. Is it now to be judged uh, by a, a, another group of people as a way to go or to put you back on another path? So I wasn't too sure about that aspect of it and what balance is there between the self-assessment component and the judgment by other people component. Sharon Jay, you want to respond to it? Um, well, what I had said, what, what I said was capturing what we had talked about. For example, we have one member in our group who is facing retirement. I don't know how many years. I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Probably within the next five years, let's say, right? <laughs> and for that person, her point was that she is more, I guess, looking forward and what to do post-retirement. She didn't say this. I'm just extrapolating what a discussion could be, right? And that for her, it would be for her to be able to look back now and say, these are the things that I've done. This is what how I've grown. And maybe what can I do now to take it further? As opposed to having somebody look at it and say, oh, she's a good teacher or not a good teacher. Oh, she did this, but not that. You know, mm -hmm. and to judge her quality as opposed to her being able to look on, at herself and say, these are some of the things that I've done. I, I don't know, maybe somebody else in the group could add. But um, the, the self-assessment is a really personal thing. And when you look back on your life and your accomplishments and so on, even if it's not retirement and you just change careers, you want to have that record to remind yourself of what you are a what you are capable of and you know how you have touched other people's lives and so on. I don't know, I'm kinda on the fly here, but somebody else could jump in. Judy, Judy has a hand up. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah. I can jump in. I, I think I, I followed the And then Rowena. 
Okay. Judy and then Rowena. Go ahead, Judy. Okay, sure. I am at the end of my, well, you know, next six years, maybe I'll be out. But um, I have not had an opportunity to, to me, get a fair assessment of what I've been able to achieve in teaching, which is a very reflective thing for me. So it's there, but it hasn't been documented. And I feel at this point, I would like to have it documented. And I would like it to be another way in which what I've done could be interpreted. So to me, the self-assessment and uh, interpretation part by others is not necessary that, um, because if you're doing good ped pedagogy and you write it down, then there should be, I, I don't know, in terms of interpretation or assessment by others, it should, you know, it should be able to stand on its own. But just to have it recorded in a way that it can easily be seen that what you were able to do achieve the objectives, whether we objectives for the course or objectives for us building that UWI student or graduate that we speak about. Okay, Rowena, add your comment and then I want to say something. Rowena, thanks, Judy. Rowena, you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't have only mic. I said I'm agreeing with um, Judy. Um, and also what Sharon is really talking about is leaving a legacy. Because that's what happens as your career matures, right? Um, you've taught so many people and you've contributed in so many ways that you want some kind of legacy which acts both to um, inspire younger um, colleagues right and uh, to leave um, um to leave information or a way of doing things which get lost so it's also about passing on um knowledge. yeah yes you think, uh, because one of the things that interests me is that whole idea of indigenous pedagogy in other words what are the types of pedagogy that most appeal to caribbean learners and why I, why I started to think of this was I was in, I went to one of the first Guardian. Um, I don't know. If it's, I don't know. Rowena, we've lost you. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So I said I early on I had gone to one of these Guardian presentations that they have been doing for Teacher of the Day. So the Teaching been, Awards. Mm -hmm. Right. And they brought this lady down and she talked about how she developed this active learning pedagogy yes. for tertiary students. And you yes. know, she was a big thing for their university and she was lecturing all over the place. And I looked at her and I thought, what is she doing that is different from what I am doing and what I right. have been doing for a much longer time? Right. So there was no sense when I went to that of what indigenous pedagogies had been developed within our classrooms right okay level, though there was some sense there's some sense of it but even at maybe at secondary or primary and even that isn't well recorded so i think that the portfolio mm -hmm. also provides that a um, record record of mm -hmm. those kinds of pedagogy okay thanks for that Rowena. and yes. so marsha I saw your hand was up and I want you to come in here before I make a comment. Now, why I'm going through this, you might think, well, why are we spending so much time on this? Because I want you to understand, really understand why you're doing this. If you're going to be doing a teaching portfolio, why you're going to be doing it. So I'm going to bring in Marsha and then I see Ricardo has his hand up. So Marsha. Okay. Um, so to me, this teaching portfolio has a big, big role in assessment. And it is primarily for assessment itself because you are gauging whether you have or the extent to which you have met certain goals or expectations that you may have set or that may have been externally set say, in your contract. Um, but I do see that there is a big part that has to rest on external evaluation because that evaluation from students, from peers, and from superiors 
becomes important to see if the value that you wanted to give is being perceived in the way you want to perceive that, that you want it perceived. Um, and the other thing that, that occurred to me is I heard somebody say that, well, does this is this teaching portfolio to be assessed by others really? It's it's to be assessed by us. I do think that it is primarily for us to assess ourselves. We're doing this for ourselves. But when you submit it, like I submitted for a teaching award, then I make myself open to be judged. And what I write there becomes what people judge. Yes. And um, I think Paula is making the point, Marcia, that it's connected to what you're saying. And she's saying as a less experienced teacher, the portfolio can be used as an instrument for her reflection and also to get feedback from people. So while you use the word judge, it's, and, it's and I think that's I what think. Sharon, yes. I think yes. that's what Sharon had the, Sharon um, Hutchinson, her, yes. her comment was in relation to that word judged. But I think Sharon talking about what their group was, was saying, to me, I felt it meant judge in the sense of what you're saying, assessing, given, getting yes. feedback, people looking at it, and then really, you know, bringing up the point that you're also able to share practices and for people to recognize. So it's also for recognition, especially becomes, for those who are older. It becomes a business. tool not just for your self-development, but it then helps other people to scaffold up. You know, and you could have a community of learning where all of us, through our portfolios, learn and teach one another, learn from and teach one another. Yes, I, I saw Ricardo had his hand up. Ricardo, do you still want to say something? Uh, yes, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm agreeing with the others as well as uh, the last point that Marcia made as well as Paolo with in that um, yes we we look at the portfolio as as an assessment whether it's um, self-assessment assessment if assessment if we are going up for uh, promotion uh, as well as if we're going for some some award or so um, uh, and I also strong more more strongly believe that it's um, it, it can be used and uh, as a developmental tool for the person to become to reflect on what what one has done and become um, and try to become a better a teacher in all and and, and to share those um, practices. Thanks. Great. Um, and so what I'll ask, okay, Sharon, Sharon G, I'll, I'll take your your point. But I'll also ask those of you who are in the other groups if you could put into the chat what you all came up with. Put it into the chat, and in particular, I want you to pinpoint if. In the discussion so far, there was anything that you didn't agree with, okay? So if you could, somebody from the other who, you know, who, if you haven't commented as yet, just put into the chat for you what are the key points to note in terms of what is a teaching portfolio based on your discussions. And if there's anything that we've said so far that you don't agree with. And Sharon, go ahead with your comments. I just wanted to add that based on the little discussion we've had here, in a bigger group, it occurred to me that your perspective really depends on where you are. So for me, as a, an early to mid-career professional where who has not achieved tenure or merit bar status as yet, for me, the portfolio, yes, it captures my personal growth and development and accomplishments and all those things so far, but I am also very cognizant of the implications of what I've done with regards to tenure and so on. Just wanted to add that, nothing in more than that. Okay, all right. So I'm waiting, you know, I'll wait for the comments and please post the comments in the chat about um, how you feel about what we've said so far. If you disagree with anything, you know. Um, and so I'll just share while you do that, while you do that, this is a more generic kind of definition, right? Um, and so it's a documented statement, and, and we have to be clear on that. So you simply talking about what your experiences are and noting it here and there and, and having it in your CV is part of that, but it's not enough. It has to be documented together, and it has to... Um, 
it has to 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 really cover not just your te not just your philosophy because um sharon asked about if somebody's going to judge your philosophy um and we you will see if people could really judge your philosophy as we go along um it's not just the philosophy it's also the responsibilities the goals and accomplishments that you have as a teacher and that's where rorina's point comes in with what you've done the day and i think um ryan had put in in the chat something about a comprehensive living document of your work achievements and experiences and it is guided by your philosophy as well all right or the chat from your original group that's gone you would have had to copy it um copy it before so what i'd suggest i should have told a little the initial stages um if you have the chat just copy it somewhere else so that you could paste it in here because once you come out of the group you're out of the group you can't go back into the group that's the unfortunate thing all right so any other questions on the teaching portfolio what it is so i want to talk about why it's useful and before i share with you some you know generic kinds of points i want marsha to share her experience in in terms of how has your because she has a fully developed e-portfolio that some of you would have probably glanced at when you went into the the course just now marsha why was this useful to you why is it you know was it useful and and how okay i um i actually started developing a portfolio for myself about 10 years ago when i was applying to ue as a lecturer um i didn't yet have a phd but i had a lot of teaching experience as a tertiary teacher elsewhere and i had a lot of work experience that i could have brought with me so i was taking stock against a job description and seeing if i where i fell if i was meeting the standards required um marsha sorry i'm just trying to focus um so so that was if the first thing i wrote out my teaching portfolio for myself and that became a part of my application to ue so it told people who i was and what oh, i okay. thought was important as a teacher how what my approach would be and where that came from what 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 experience in my life and what values were shaping the way i would teach and the way i would assess then um coming into being a teacher i I um developed on that portfolio just in order to see how well I was doing. I was hitting some spots which many of us might hit during our career where I was feeling demotivated, feeling like I didn't have the support I wanted sometimes. That kind of thing and um I had to take stock and so the portfolio helped me to take stock of who I was if I was still aligned with what I thought was important or if I was letting all the busyness of life in in academia get in the way of me staying true to what i thought was important and then i came to the teaching portfolio workshop and built it up much more in order to see what are my students experiences what are my peers experiences where am um, where am i exceeding meeting or falling short of the different things that i thought was important or that externally were stated to be important for example getting assessed for for um tenure getting assessed for the merit bar so i did all of this just for me um to chart my path and then finally when i developed the, the final version i realized it was time to decide if i want to apply for the teaching award and i had a teaching portfolio in front of me that was meeting the standards so i decided to go for it I surprise surprise as somebody who didn't have a PhD yet I actually won the teaching award and I was so cool so it gave me a little validation where I had a lot of doubt about if I was good enough mm. so so it was not only a personal at a personal level it was also important to career 
Now, my it's question really then... Because it helps me with the tenure, looking for tenure and so on as well. Right. So now, anybody else here, did anybody start a portfolio? I just want to know. So that, you know, I could have a sense of anybody who started a portfolio, if you just indicate by raising your hand, using the raising your hand icon. Okay, so Tala, you started. All right. Um, okay, and Sharon, you started well in Cuttle, but you don't have access to it now? All right. Well, we okay. did it as part of the assessment, and it was something that Margot had created for us. And, well, when Cuttle finished, we, we lost access to it, I think. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, and Ryan, you did your philosophy in Cuttle, so that's the start. All right. Okay, so some of you have have a start. You have a start. So so we have something there to work with. So what I'd want you to do is as we go through, see how what I'm saying resonates with what you've done and if, you know, it will help you in improving what you have, making what you have better, you know. Um, the idea behind what we're going to do is to help you pull the things together because all of you would have elements, but it's how you bring that together to make it cohesive. And so I want to highlight some of the points that Marsha would have made, but I wanted her to share her experience as a lecturer, as somebody who did this, and as somebody who did it well enough for, for other people to look at it and say, you know, this reflects a good teacher. And that's the bottom line. Eh? It's about you reflecting what you do that makes you an effective teacher for, you know, however we try to define that. So I have here, if you look at that slide, I have what I call summative reasons and formative reasons. So summative and, and Marsha attested to this for assessment and promotion. It's it's an important tool and Sharon, you talked about that too. So it's definitely useful for that. If you decide you want to leave UWI and go somewhere else, it's it gives you an edge as a teacher if you could show what you have done and that you have put thought behind what you do. You're mindful about what you do. It presents you as a professional. So for employment and for teaching awards. So so those are the summative reasons you do it and bam, that's you know an end an end thing. It's an end game thing. Formative purposes. For you as a professional, how do you improve? So it helps you reflect. Look, that first activity I gave you all was meant for you to reflect. The first first thing I asked you all to do was to think about a motto. So it's really meant to reflect on what drives you as a person and as a teacher do you have a motto and if you don't do you need a motto so self-reflection with of course the, the the purpose of improving it's also meant to promote collaboration because if you talk about sharing with other people your expectation is to get some kind of feedback um and and perhaps create that as much as in that community where you, you might find like-minded people. Out of that, you might find someone who wants to do some research with you because they see you're doing something on indigenous teaching, on on active learning in a different kind of way. And that might pr prompt some kind of collaboration that might not have happened because nobody knew what you were doing. And, of course, it provides that evidence. We always talk about evidence of teaching. So... Why I asked if you all have started is because I can't give you a formula. There's no real formula. I can't tell you what you're doing is wrong. But what I could suggest is what are the elements that would lead to something that's considered a good portfolio? And that will help you develop yours. So even though Marsha is here with us and I ask her specifically to share her experiences and so, and I'm sharing her portfolio, we are not saying to you that this is the only way to do it. This was this is this reflects Marsha. This is who she is. She's done it as part of who she is, and so it will reflect her. You will have to find the formula that reflects you. Right? So the three main components, and as I said, there's no formula, but when someone is looking at a portfolio, there's a certain expression, and you all identified this in the, def the, the main definition that was put in the chat, and since you all didn't disagree with it, I'm assuming that the discussions in the other groups 
identify the same kinds of elements. Teaching philosophy and goals. And you'll see why the teaching philosophy is critical because when people are looking at a portfolio, they want to see the connections. If you say you have certain teaching strategies, what drives those teaching strategies? Where are you coming from? What position are you coming from that would drive your teaching strategy? Now, nobody's going to say to you that your philosophy is wrong. But what they would look for is to see whether the philosophy that you have espoused is really connected to the way you do what you do. And and somebody might say to me, look, you know, you said that you are interested in student-centered learning. But I note that, you know, when you're teaching, this is how you do your teaching. And, it, you know, maybe you need to, if you're really interested in, in student-centered learning, maybe these are some strategies that you could try as well. So teaching philosophy and goals is a key component. The responsibilities and the activities which you all identified, you must have that. And of course, a key element that people forget or that people think is not important is your evidence of effective teaching. So I want to ask Marsha to just mention for us, this is a difficult part for people. What did you use as your evidence of effective teaching? Okay, I um, I use evidence. I actually am in my evidence page on the portfolio. I use endorsements from other academics. Um, so I used um two pairs actually. Rianne is here. She was one, and I used um my superior across in engineering when I used to teach in engineering, and um, got endorsement letters from them. I also judge myself against UNI's needs, so I looked at the um, the distinctive graduate um, port profile, and I evaluated how well I was focusing on that through my course courses, and a lot of my evaluation came from peer observations where people came to my classroom and did reviews of how I was teaching and helped me to build my approach. So I, sh I then followed that up with a continual improvement plan to show how I was going to deal with the gaps that had been identified. I put in videos of myself teaching and a reflective um, exercise I did to point out all the things that I thought had been strong and also the things that had been weak. And again, that went into my plan for how I was going to improve as a teacher. I also spent a lot of time sharing my students' feedback. And that is in the link I think that you give to everybody. So it includes students from engineering as well as all the different courses I teach. And the students who had left and were still coming back to me, even though they were working for some years, to get advising and so on. So I got letters of support from them. I also put in artifacts and so on that I had kept over the years um, as students sent me emails and sent me cards and so on. So those things showed up as evidence. Um, and lastly, I used the course evaluations, the SECL um, surveys that UWE does. I use those to give quantitative evaluation feedback and also qualitative feedback about my attributes and my performance. Right. Thanks for that. And what I want to note is you see the variety of sources of evidence that Marsha is. It wasn't just the people immediately think of the SECL, the SECL report, because that's the most obvious thing and it's an easy thing to, 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 ha to get. But you need to have a rich variety of, of feedback. So she had from peers, she had from students. You know, and she had a variety of feedback from the students. She had actual videos. So you have to start to think about what evidence do I have that will show that what I'm doing is quote-unquote effective, right? 
So I wanted to highlight that because that is one of the areas where people tend to have the most difficulty in beefing up their portfolios. So let me start. I I Go just ahead, wanted to say that one thing that I thought was important is showing that you're not perfect. You weren't editing this thing to show that only the good stuff. So I showed that I had had flaws and I also showed that I, I was cognizant of my weaknesses and that I was working toward moving, moving them in the right direction. Excellent point. You all want to make any comments before I or ask any Marsha anything before I go on to this next slide? Yes, Sharon. Marsha, Sharon has a question. I just want to say, Marsha, what a beautiful portfolio you have done. I love the hyperlinks. I love the evidence. I could never have thought to do anything like this. So thanks for that model. Thanks for sharing. It goes back to the discussion we were having before about the purpose of it and what, what Rowena talked about, um, the, like leaving your legacy for younger or other colleagues to look at, to learn from. To develop their own practice so it's not just about your development but it's about what we can learn from it so thank you well that's Great. so cool um but it does fit right into my motto which which is connect and inspire right so yes i i want to step up i want to connect and, and empower myself but i also at core want to empower everybody else right and i see everybody else as doing that for me as well yeah. judy Judy, you have a question? Uh, I think your mic probably off, Judy. Yeah. I'm just asking um, your subject area. Uh, I, I am an industrial engineer by training. Um, uh, I used to teach across in engineering, teach production and operations and technical communications courses like that. And I'm now across in social sciences. I teach occupational safety and health management, quality management, and business strategy. Right. OK. All right. So um, thanks again for that, Marsha. I'm so happy that, that you're with us to, to, so people could have a, a good example of, of um, how to do this. So I want to start with the teaching philosophy and you see the question I posed: do I even have a teaching philosophy um, and what is your teaching philosophy some of you have it like Rand said she did hers in Cuttle and once if you did Cuttle you should have done it Sharon um, Jagannath you would have done it too in, as part of that portfolio that you did so it should reflect what you believe about teaching what you believe about learning why you believe that how what you believe is demonstrated in the classroom how do you teach how do your students make a difference in how you teach what are the things you don't like as a teacher all right um and so those are just some of the things now i shared with you a slide or oh, rebecca you didn't you didn't see it all right so i will post the I will post a link in the chat to Marsha's um, to Marsha's portfolio because those of you who didn't get into my learning would not have seen it. So I'll post the link now so so those of you could click on it and look at it. So you could go on and look at it in a while. I'll post that to, as soon as I finish. I'm giving you the next task. Everybody should have gotten in the attachments that I sent a set of teaching. Um, philosophies it was all on one document so just check check that email I'm, I'm giving you a couple minutes to so just check and see it's a PDF file um, teaching philosophies and you would have seen in that file I'm just looking at it now so I could tell you um, who should who whose philosophies you should see in it I was just opening for me. Um, right, so there's one Rachel Moran and there's one from Terry Waga and there's one from C.M. Mattison, right? And there's one from John Campbell, John Campbell 
as well, deceased John Campbell. Um, oh, you found it, right, okay. So once, I hope you all have that file. So what we're gonna do, I'm going to break you all up into groups again, all right? And I will come into the group. You can't see the last question on the slide. The last beliefs about his or her effectiveness as a teacher. Each group to be assigned a teaching philosophy and identify what the author believed about his or her students when I give you the philosophy, what they believe they should do to help them become better learners ideas or concepts about the learning process that influence their teaching and how this translated into action and beliefs about their effectiveness as a teacher. So basically you're looking at their, you're, you're kind of assessing their philosophy and seeing if they have these elements in there and what they've said about the elements. And so I'll post these questions in the chat in each um, group and I will also, when I go into the group, tell you which one to look at and I will take note of who is doing what so when we come back out what I want you all to do is one person from the group to share what you all thought of the philosophy and what elements you identified in it you don't have to regurgitate what the elements are but just say whether you saw it in there and you know what you thought of the philosophy whether you saw the elements in there and what you thought of the philosophy how it resonated with you how you feel about it so that's what you'll be doing when you come back um no i'll give you all one to review when i come into the group so that everybody wouldn't be looking at the same one all right so i'll do that in a bit first i'll just post the link for marsha's um for marsha's portfolio so that those of you who didn't see it could also take a few minutes to look at it yes so I'll post instructions in each group so that's the Marshall's the link to Marshall's portfolio that I just posted in the chat so those of you could copy that paste it so you could have a look at that and uh, in the meantime you could start to browse quickly the portfolios and I'll come into each group post the the um the questions that I'm asking here and give you a sign of a portfolio okay so justin could put people into the groups now and i'll come into the groups in a bit and share um and share the question and so on all right so just make sure that you have the the document ready for you all to to be able to discuss all right, so I'll see you. And you will have, it is now 11.15, so you'll have five minutes to read the philosophy and then another 10 minutes to discuss and so on. And then we come back by about 11.35 into the main room. Okay, so I'll see you all in a little bit. I'm going to go into each group as you go into the group. Right, so welcome back into the room. So... I hope that, that that activity was intended to get you, again, is to help you reflect. Huh? As you read somebody else's philosophy, it triggers things for you. There will be things in there you'll see that you may like. There will be things in there you see that you would say, eh -eh, I wouldn't put that in my philosophy. Because the point is, it's your philosophy. It has to be your philosophy. So um, let me get some feedback. So group one, that is the group with, Camille and Giselle, Nicole, Paula, Talia, etc. John Campbell. If I if we could hear from you all. Oh, uh, yeah, we didn't choose a person to speak, so I guess I'll just jump in. Um, I was the last one speaking at the end. But one of the things I was saying though to Sharon is that he 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 spoke about his um, lack of enjoyment um of math class but um he was speaking there about um schooling and i think that that meant secondary schooling um feelings um that he expressed were feelings of inadequacy 
face with the class and we, we spoke about that a lot because we felt that that guy did a lot of his um his thinking and he, he writes about an all-encompassing approach um and um making the students feel comfortable to ask questions uh to criticize uh or to question what what the teacher says and the ability to make an overall enjoyable experience and we identified a lot with that with that um with that feeling okay. i don't know if anyone else in the group wants to add in anything does that capture the group y'all had a nice long discussion I was, I was, I heard a little bit of it. I heard Talia going and giving a whole long thing. <laughs> that I can add. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking, yes. Right, because I was eavesdropping and I heard a whole long thing and, and then you come in and just Nicole talk and everybody quiet. Come on, you're I, acting I, like I a student. It was not meant to be lengthy. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> just no, I, meant, I didn't mean it as a criticism. I meant there was some, I should have said a rich, something <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't taken as a criticism but i understand <laughs> um but but i think what um the contribution really was just reading through um the philosophy here it just dawned on me that oftentimes we enter the classroom and as teachers sometimes persons take things for granted in terms of what is done in the classroom and the impact that they have on students in that process so that we we enter and we leave but how many of us think of, I wonder how students felt today, or did I deliver in such a way as to leave an impact in the minds of the students? And for me, that hit me very hard for his particular philosophy because it, it reminds us, and as he said in his particular piece, that when you, you, you try to score, I don't know if scoring was a word that, I would, that, that resonates with me, but the use of scoring in the classroom every time and all the time when you deliver, for me, it's, it was an important part of what I took away from that particular philosophy. So for you, scoring, scoring more than feedback? He said scoring, um, yeah. he used the word scoring. And you like that? It was just his way, yeah, it was just his way of saying, making an impact. Okay, did anybody get anything else from, from that that you want to share? So scoring, I'm just putting it in the chat. And um, Nicole, what was the what was the key takeaway for you? I'm just gonna put the words so we see all the all the words that resonated with people. A key word, if you if you had to use a word or a phrase to capture a key takeaway. I I would say the enjoyable experience. Okay. And those of you who remember John Campbell would, I don't know if you all would remember his, his course, he taught the foundation course, Caribbean Civilization. And one of the things that I always remember, he'd have students who, who graduated, who would go back to, to the, and sit in the course, you know? So, all right. I'm mindful of the time because I know Sharon Hutchinson said she had to leave at 12. Um, so I'm going to go to the next group and if anybody in this group, group one, has anything to add, put it in the chat in terms of your takeaway. Um, group two, which was the group with Judy and Marsha and Rebecca, etc. Hector, is it Hector? Um, you all looked at Rachel Moran. Could you share with us some key takeaways? I want you all to, you could share it in the chat too, but get a spokesperson. Ah, I don't think I've heard from Hector for the, for the day. Hector, are you there? Yes, you have. <laughs> I have? <laughs> Rebecca, what about you? Rebecca, are you there? If you're there, turn your mic on. Yeah, I know I heard from you, but I'm picking on you. Sorry, Rachel. 
Any, what was a key takeaway for you from Rachel? And I mean, from the discussions you all had. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is Sharon. Okay. Oh, it's to the Rebecca, for... Rebecca can speak. I just put up what the group suggested. Oh, great. Okay. So we could all just look at that. What the author well, believed could, about it as a student. Could I be pushy again and jump in because I was in this group? <laughs> This is jump Sharon, in, jump in, jump in, jump in, Sharon. I think in the end, we summarized our thinking about the piece that we read. And we all agreed that we liked the reflective approach to her statement. So she didn't just write, this is my teaching philosophy, and here are some sources to support it. Or, you know, she really gave you that story of herself, and it reflected who she is on the inside and what was important to her as a teacher and why and we we saw how her personal experiences shaped her self-concept as a student and informed her journey towards self-actualization if we could say that she's there yet as a teacher it also tells you about her teacher identity who she sees herself and how she associate what she associates with teaching and those things um, informed how she sees her students and how she treats them. And mm. she always draws on her own needs as a student and how they were met by this ideal teacher in her mind. And because that is her ideal teacher, she strives towards, even so many years later, being like that teacher because that teacher touched the, the eight-year-old or however old child she was who had needs that were not met by other people. So her story came out in that philosophy, not just what she thinks about teaching and learning and students. Her story came out in her deep reflection that was evident in writing that statement. Wow. OK. You all want to add anything to that? I think that, that captures a lot. <laughs> uh, don't you think that in John Campbell, that was similar because his experience mm -hmm. uh, in a student, I, I think I just mm -hmm. kind of browsed it. Uh, and I could see that in a Caribbean classroom, you know, of being a student in a Caribbean classroom where the focus is so much on the right answer and the good student, which is the one who gets the answer that the teacher wants. Then mm -hmm. other people like Campbell, who is so, such a brilliant um, historian of education, you know, feeling inadequate. And you won't think that yeah. somebody like this would have felt inadequate. But it's how yeah. you took that. Yes, that's a good point. Well, sorry. It's how you took that and reflected on it, which is which is a similar thing that Sharon is saying here, and reflected on it to to shift and to shape his understanding of, of, of a particular lecturer. Hmm. Yes. And <laughs> and that point that you've made um rowena is important because and when i think about my own yeah. teaching philosophy a lot of it comes out of my experience as well as a student and i'm sure for a lot of you the way you teach is either based on what you would have experienced that you liked or what you would have experienced that you did like and you've said to yourself i will never do this when i'm teaching so, so, so that point about your experience as a student is an important one. All right. Could I ask it the third I, group? Yeah, sure. Who's yes. That? Could I add before you were Hector? Yes, Hector. I think there is one other bit, bits and piece that we could have um, looked at in terms of what was really good about the piece. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the specific ex specific examples that the author used to look at the assessment forms and methods and also the philosophy of that was presented it tends to be an all-inclusive um, one that looks at not just the vulnerable but also not just the class on a whole but also the vulnerable individuals in the group okay very good point yeah, yeah. um could we have the third group? I just got a little distracted. Sorry, Hector. Yeah. Could we have the, the third group? That you all would have looked at Terry Moran. 
that's Rian, Ricardo, etc. Who's going to share from the group? Hi, so I was just waiting on Rowena. We had decided that she would speak, but that's okay. Um, okay. But she oh, no, so but I, I but that is not our group. Our group is not Wagner. Yes, Terry, Terry Wagner. Yeah. Oh, Terry Wagner. Okay, yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry. I, I, I miss you. The, the thing. Oh, it's right. listening. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So Terry Wagner had a very um, clear description of what he believed um, a learner was and what influenced learning, and then what he, his role was. So he talked about learners being experience that learning being an experiential process. Um, importantly, he felt all students had the ability to learn, and learning was something natural. It was uh, a, a human capacity that we all had, and that learning therefore occurred um, through doing. That's the experiential aspect, interaction um, with real life examples. So that authenticity um, was an important part of learning. And uh, he saw himself as a coach or mentor, and you could see within the examples that he gave, how he um, highlighted the ways in which he encouraged that interaction in the class, you know, questioning, discussion, using examples which students could relate to. You could also see how he enjoyed the students bringing to him um, knowledge. You know, so there was a very um, close link between himself as coach and mentor, his belief about how learning takes place and his classroom activities. Right? So that was a that was a well strength of that piece. Okay. As we read the piece and we came to the end, he talked about his firmness for deadlines, etc. And that you know he if he set a deadline, the students had to follow it. He was not flexible in this area. And to us, that seemed to be a contradiction of somebody who saw themselves as a coach and mentor and brought uh -huh. to the students that authenticity, I think it was some business subject you were doing, of what happens in real life, and then that inflexibility within the classroom. Because in real life, like it's happening now with Corona, you know, things happen. And as a coach, and I was giving them the example of using Bolt's coach, because he did a nice documentary on Bolt and his coach, you know. One of the things that you do it while you, you set those standards, which he said he did, was there was also that kind of empathy towards um, the learner and the not just the learner within the classroom, but the learner within their life, you know. So we thought the last paragraph offered some contradiction and maybe if he was sharing this with peers, maybe something that we might have asked him to reflect on. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So what I want you all to do now, given that you've reviewed at least one, some of you might have glanced at the others while we were waiting, I want you to start to think about what your own teaching philosophy is going to look like. All right, um, and I'm going to share with you a tool. Now, Marsha, I don't know if you use this tool in doing yours, if it was useful. When I put it up, I'm going to put it up now, and um, and uh, you will let me know if you use it at all, and if it was useful. And uh, um, if it, I want you all to to see if you could use it. You should have received it. I'm waiting for the file to, to come up. It's taken a little while now. I don't know. It's probably fed up of of um <laughs> of us now. So it should come up in a little bit. Right. You should be seeing it. Template for developing a teaching philosophy. I emailed that yesterday as one of the files. If you didn't get the email, let me know and I will send the email to you now. Um, Marsha, did you use this at all to help you? What I am, 
Mm -hmm. I am it. suspecting that as a Cuttle student back around 2015, when you taught us in Cuttle, this may have been something I used to do, a draft of a philosophy back then. Okay. All right. So could you let me know who doesn't have it? Um, I want you all to spend just about 10 minutes looking at it and brainstorming, looking to see um, what you could put there if it will help you in shaping your philosophy. And if not, then start to, to brainstorm your philosophy. So I'm giving you all 10 minutes. That's an individual activity because it's your philosophy. Um, and if you want to ask questions in between, I'm here, Marsha is here, Justin is here. You could put something in the chat, we'll respond to that. Um, but I want you all to start to work on your philosophy now. So that you, you could see if you have any questions, you could see if there are things that you're not too sure about whether that should be in a, in a teaching philosophy. So let me know if you don't have this template. It's just, it just offers some guides, some prompts to help you determine what you could put into your philosophy. But you could also use the experience of looking at other philosophies that I shared. Um, you could look at Marshall's in the link that I sent you and start to craft yours. So that's the task now. As Diane, working, yes, definitely I would have used this. I'm looking at it and I remember using it. Okay, great. And um, yes, it is useful. All right. So any questions on the task? So the task now is to start Start brainstorming your philosophy and try and use, you can use a tool as a guide to, to brainstorm. It gives you some prompts. Any questions? So I'm just giving you 10, ten minutes, 10 minutes of working. Judy, did you get it? It's a Word document so that you could fill it in. If you didn't get it, tell me I could email it right now. Okay. It's for personal use, but I want you after the uh, 10 minutes, for personal use, but after the 10 minutes, I just want you all to say whether, um, what, if you need any guidance, if, if you have any questions about it, or you could do that during the process, because Marsha is here. I am here, Justin is here. Oh, um, Rian, you don't really have access to, your, to the old course shells. It's like your students in your courses. They don't have access to the course once, once it's done. Um, but if you tell me what you wanted to get, I can get it. I can see if I could get it for you, depending on what it is. But the students are usually removed from the course. So if it's something that you did, if it's something you submitted, I may have it. Oh, are you supposed to keep that, Rian? I'll check and see. Sharon, what's wrong? You know, just the idea that we can't access those cuddle course shells because, you know, I spent a lot of time developing it. <laughs> and all the material, I think Justin had helped me get access to it once, but I can't, I don't have access to it anymore. So, what your philosophy? The whole thing, everything on the course shell, including that. Anyway. Oh, you developed a, you developed a course? A course shell? Yeah, when we were, when I was in cuddle, that was one of the requirements. I got a little trophy and thing for it, right? But everything remained in the core shell. So, all right, hmm. never mind. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how we could, if we could help. Because what you need to do is review what you did then, and see how things have changed. If there's anything you want to add.
Anthony, Sharon, and Rianne. Um, and we'd have to make sure that's my learning. I don't know, Sharon, you schoology or my learning. Yes, we did it on my learning. It was um, a temporary course shell that, that we were given each access to to create, to develop our course shell and course plan and all that. Yeah, just okay, as, right. It was in my learning right, that good. we did that, but it, it was okay. like a test course shell kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. And cuddle. But I think with, with Rianne, it's not that. It's I don't know if her teaching philosophy would have been in her course shell. Her teaching philosophy would have been in the in the actual cuddle course. Yes, Diane, um, you're right. Um, so my apologies, but yes, I lost all my materials from cuddle, unfortunately. Yes, Marsha, it was uploaded as an assignment submission. What you guys can probably do is um, go to the same cetl.mylearning.sta.gw, right? And uh, can you hear me? Hello. Can you post, can you post that okay. link in the chat, please, Justin? All right. I need to, but what I'm just saying is that you'll have to, I think back then you had students. Let me just verify. Let me just verify one time. Okay. So what we could do, though, Justin, is... We'll deal with, with Rian and Sharon separately outside of this. So you could you could we could probably email you both after, right? Thank you. Okay. Oh, Rebecca, Rebecca, I know you have to leave now. Um, what I would ask, are you hearing me? Or are you gone? I think she's gone already. Yes, yes, um, I know you have to leave, but what I wanted you to do was to please try and work on the philosophy what I would do is I'm going to create, a, you can't see the, the third question. Um, did you get the, the 
you should use the word the word um document that i sent don't use don't try to read what's on the screen yes yeah, so i want you to i'm going to create a space in the my learning course there that you all can upload the document to okay so that i can have a look at some of the teaching philosophies where you all are so that will be the homework for the session so if you all could do that i will create the assignment space for you all to do it all right this session isn't ended just yet i'm going to come back in a while but because rebecca is leaving i wanted to let her know right great okay all right rebecca yes yes go on yeah, why can you ask? see the third question oh because you really weren't supposed to be reading it from there that was just so you all will know what um what is on but the third question the third is, question the first question is thinking about students identifying no, third, 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 three number one, three one thinking about learning thinking about yourself as a teacher identify three beliefs or views you hold about your effectiveness as a teacher give examples effectiveness or the strongest and weakness and or only strength only what weakness and strength or Think only thinking yes. about yourself as Self a, teacher. a teacher three beliefs of three belief belief yes. yeah yeah yes belief about your effectiveness yeah yeah, yeah yeah okay so yeah, thank I'm you to, right i'm going to stop this individual activity now um i just wanted you all to get started so that you all could see if um if you have any other any questions or so before we go and i know people have to start leaving so i'm going to wrap up now um remember this is just the first part of the of the workshop we have part two next week all right so what i wanted to just quickly go over is so i want you all to start writing your teaching portfolio and remember the other things that would go into a portfolio would be your teaching activities and responsibilities that is what exactly do you do and the evidence of teaching effectiveness so we'll start to talk about that in the next session um we'll go over that in the next session what are it what are some things that we we look at when you're looking at teaching responsibilities next week is the same time 10 to 12:30 and um we'll go over the other elements that you need to fill out fill in your teaching portfolio so for now we focused on what is a teaching portfolio and how it can be structured why it is useful and the first component of the portfolio which is the teaching philosophy and so we're going to look at the other components of the teaching portfolio next session and uh, we will also at that time look at one tool that you could use to do an online portfolio because now that's that's what people are looking for an online portfolio so i'm going to wrap up now um any questions or comments before we go no questions Sharon has a question in the chat she's asking if the time stays the same next week the yes. yes that's what i said it's 10 to 12:30 um we're going to try to stick to that time um so you could adjust your schedules for that i'm try i try to wrap up a little earlier today because i realized people had other meetings and so um So Tal is asking if question 2 and 3 overlaps. Question 2 which is the thinking about learning and thinking about yourself as a teacher. Three ideas or concepts you hold about the learning process that influence your teaching. All the questions can overlap. Um 
Talia, to be honest. But yes, question two and three, definitely there could be some overlap. So your homework, Ricardo, is to start drafting your teaching philosophy. Um, try and at least get a couple paragraphs done. And what I would ask people to do is I'm going to create an assignment um, drop box in the my e-learning workshop that I that I gave you all access to. And so you can share your your philosophies in that drop box. It's going to be in the first block and it's going to be called drop box for draft teaching portfolios. So um, I, I urge you all to share that over the next week so that when we come for the next session, we can move on from the teaching port teaching philosophy. I would look and give people comments in there um, based on what I see in there. All right. Anything you all want to ask, Marsha, before we go in terms of helping you to prepare that philosophy? Marsha, anything you want to share with them? Because I think people are tired now. Energy levels have dropped. Um, to me, the, what's important is what is hard. And that is to show yourself um, and not, not hide who you are and, and why you believe what you believe and, and how you see your students, what gap it is you really feel called to fill through your teaching that feels like you're making yourself a little bit naked and you're putting it out there for everybody to read. So, but the, the, the more willing you are to do that, the better your philosophy is, I think. Okay. All right. So on that note, yeah, on that note, yes, I, I think that's a nice way to end. And I would like to... Uh, well, I'm hoping that you all will be back next week at 10, same place, same time, same place. And any questions you have in between, please just feel free to email. And I'm hoping that Marsha can join us again next week because that will be a crucial time. So stay safe, everybody, and um, I'm wrapping up. I'm going to stop the recording.